We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Keith Newmeyer, President and CEO of First Majestic Silver. Thanks for joining me today, Keith. Uh, it's great seeing you again, Tom. Great to have you back on the show. And uh, it's been a while, so it's going to be good to get an update from you. So in your recent presentation in Germany, you talked about the 10 to 20 year goal of removing ICU vehicles from, from the roads and that it was very likely going to take at least double that amount of time. So could we see an underestimation of the amount of silver needed in this transition as well? Well, I don't think there's anyone actually estimating the number. You know, that's that, that's the problem we've got. And, um, you know, whatever input you want to look at, you know, whether it's copper or silver or, or any of the other metals that are necessary to achieve these, um, you know, these government objectives, you know, they're just not realistic because the, the metal's just not there. Um, you know, this is a 50 year process to change the way we electrify the planet. Um, it, it's, it's an enormous task. It's going gonna, it's gonna to require all governments working together with industry in a cooperative manner and to try to get this job done and to get off oil and gas to a degree. We're never, I don't think, going to be 100 percent off oil and gas. Um, it'll all, always be necessary in some component of the of the energy grid or the supply chain. But, um, you know, nevertheless, uh, you know, we can reduce it uh, by a substantial amount by using new technologies. Um, I personally am a fan of hydrogen. You know, I think that's that's really going to be or nuclear. I think, you know, those are probably really the two long term solutions to 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 the current situation. Um, you know, the electrical battery and the and electric cars are a good stepping stone, you know, to get us there. So considering the, the growth of the tech sector in recent times, Keith, how misguided is it for them to be demonizing the mining sector? You mentioned nuclear power there recently. Uh, um, and, you know, it, it just seems that at every turn, the, the mining industry is is held back and demonized by these tech companies. Yeah, it is pretty shocking. Um, I, I've been in the mining sector now for 35 years, and, and uh, I'm a big proponent of the mining sector. I'm sure we, the mining sector can get better, uh, but I think any sector can get better, um, you know, with innovation and technology. Technology is improving businesses throughout the world, regardless of the industry that you happen to be in. Um, in mining, um, yeah, we're probably behind on some things. You know, the mining sector tends to move very slowly, but, you know, that's just because of the investment cycle. You know, it, it takes 20 years to get a mine up and running. So, you know, if you pick a certain technology to produce a certain metal, you're going to build an infrastructure and a plant designed for that particular thing. And it's going to be producing for 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and it takes a long time to get paid back. It takes big investments to build these operations, infrastructure, you know, water, you know, uh, electrical. You know, mining companies have to do the whole thing. You have to build communities in a lot of cases. So, so you know, um, um, you know, and and these are long term jobs as well. And then uh, you know, these jobs pay for kids' schooling, uh, university education. Um, you know, when you have a business there that's generating as much as a mine does for 50 years, that's a couple of generations, or at least a generation and a half. So that that's really the driving economy of that town. And these high tech companies, they don't see that, and right? they look at you know the mining sector as some e evil you know company, but yet um, uh, we're polluting you know polluting the planet or something like that. Which is yeah, yes, that type of thing goes on, but not from the big companies like the First Majestic, you know, or you know, or the you know the um, you know the, the smaller local artisanal miners, you know, uh, those are the ones that are actually you know creating all the all the havoc, all the pollution. You know, they're using bad techniques and and, and they don't care what goes into the rivers and and things like that. And we're always battling against uh, you know those types of artisanal miners because you know we bring proper technology, proper techniques to the business. But I'm not sure what presentation you were referring to, but there was a presentation I did in, in uh, uh, Germany where I pointed out, you know, the top five high tech companies. Um, I think they have, I think my slide said it has a market cap of something like uh, $5 trillion in that range. And, and, and the top uh, 50 mining companies had a market cap of $500 um, billion, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, 
And, and, and these, these um, five high-tech companies wouldn't exist without these 50 mining companies. So, Keith, are there any scenarios where you could see the possibility of any of these major tech companies moving towards owning their own mines in order to secure supply of raw materials for their production? Well, you've seen the movie iRobot and, uh, you know, uh, the movie Terminator. <laughs> you know, I'm not exactly sure where the world is going, but, um, you know, as AI, you know, comes into being and uh, you know, you've heard Elon Musk speak about uh, AI and, you know, his concerns about, about it and so on. And, you know, who knows what the next 50 to 100 years is going to look like. But, um, um, you know, we are big corporations are getting bigger. You know, we 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 now I think have three trillion dollar companies, if 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 I'm correct on that, um, it could be four actually. But uh, nevertheless, you know, that's never happened. You know, we've never had a trillion dollar company, and these companies are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And any company, even the first majestic, you know, we want to own more of our supply chain. You know, the more that our supply chain that we can control, the more profits that we will make, and and the less volatility volatility we'll have in our business because we have more control over it. Uh, so any company wants all that. You know, you could call it monopolistic if you wish, or you know, call what you know, whatever, throw any name at it. But that's just a fact of life. You know, it's efficiencies as far as the senior management is concerned. So if you're at the high level of Apple, and you're you're you, you need silver, you know, to produce your iPhones and your iPads and all that, and you know, silver, there's only a, a limited amount of supply out there. You know, why not go buy yourself a silver mine or buy a First Majestic so, so you own a portfolio of silver mines? You know, I think that's very likely to happen. Mm-hmm. So, Keith, we, we consistently hear about the supply shortfall and record demand for silver. But I'd like to get your thoughts on if we see this, this price trend continue, if someday that leads us to a place where the manufacturers need to move towards finding silver substitutes if they can't get supply. Well, that's the problem, right? Because there is no substitute. You know, we, we, have, we have a headline on our websites clearly stating there's no substitute for silver. You know, you know DuPont, you know, who's the largest uh, silver paste manufacturer for solar panels, um, you know, they've been trying to uh, um, reduce the amount of silver they use in this paste. You know, for you know, for economic purposes, you know, the the word that I've heard from from experts in the area is they pretty well or have already reached the limit. They they you know they just can't reduce more silver, uh, or or they just start losing efficiencies. Um, uh, so you know whether that's exactly true or not, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not a scientist, but um, that's you know, the information I've been able to gather. Um, I saw an article um, out of London, England, just uh, about two weeks ago, suggesting that uh, in 2022, there's going to be 140 million ounces of silver consumed in the solar uh, panel industry, which is a pretty big number, you know, because the number for 2021, we don't know what it is yet. It's not public, but it's somewhere around 100 million ounces. So, or, uh, um, so you know, whether it's a 30, 40 percent increase year over year, that's a pretty darn big number. Uh, and, and the miners are only producing 800 million ounces in one year. So you've got, you've got one buyer for, you know, almost well, close to 20 percent of the entire entire supply. And then you've got, you know, uh, the electric car industry. And, and I haven't seen the 2020 production numbers yet. I, I don't know sure why they're not out. I've looked looked for them, but haven't been able to find them yet. But the 2019 numbers, um, um, there was 95 million cars built worldwide. And there's less in 2020, of course, of COVID and so on and so forth. But 19, mm-hmm. 2019. And of those 95 million cars built in 2019, 5 million of them were electric vehicles. And we consume 60 million ounces of silver to to produce those five million electric cars. Mm-hmm. So you know, if if uh, governments want to reduce the the or, or increase the electric vehicle fleet on the planet, they're, they're not going to do it at five million cars a year. They, you know, they're they're going to have to do it at 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 million cars a year. Mm-hmm. And and you know, how are we how are we going to get there? Uh, we'll, you know, I don't even think the manufacturing like Volkswagens, Audis, BMWs, Mercedes, Teslas that, you know, they're just ramping up now. So it's going to take them a couple of years to get even get close to those kinds of numbers. And, and, and if, um, you know, 5 million ounces or pardon me, 5 million electric cars equals 60 million ounces, you do the math. You know, that's a lot of silver in a pretty small market. Mm-hmm. And, and at 5 million vehicles per year being produced, you're probably not even 
replacing the amount of internal combustion engines that are coming off of the market, off of the roads, right? I wouldn't think so. These are people that are just buying new cars and, and uh, you know, they, their used car goes to a family member or, or it gets sold mm-hmm. and, and, and gets resold. So that fuel combustion car is still, you're right, it's, I guess that's a fantastic point. It's still on the road. You just added another car. Mm-hmm. Now, there's so, about 1.4 billion cars sitting on the surface of the earth right now, apparently. Mm-hmm. So is it possible that silver recycling ever becomes an important source of supply in the near future, Keith? You know, it's it back in 2011 when silver hit uh, $50, uh, according to the Silver Institute, um, the recycling hit 240 million or 250 million ounces that year. It was the highest ever. Um, they did, this is where, you know, all the silverware, you know, started coming into the system. You know, anyone that had, you know, you know, it was just free money, basically, I guess, in a way. And then so all of a sudden, you know, all the silver hit the market. So what would have to, what would the price have to be for that to occur again? Because the theory is that that silver is gone now. You know, it's been consumed in electronics. So, you know, you would need, what, $80, $100 silver before you'd have a huge influx of uh, new new recycle metal. I don't know. Um, um, you know, I have personally invested in a couple of recycling companies um, here in Canada, and uh, two of them are bankrupt. Uh, one is still uh, surviving because it's just so difficult to get this metal out of these electronics. Um, you know, these, these uh, electronic manufacturers are very good at embedding Tinies of tiny amounts of gold and silver and copper into layers and layers of silicon wafers and and and, uh, and computer boards and to get it out it's just it's just not economic um, mm-hmm. so a lot of this computer waste just builds up and and uh, and and even China is not taking computer waste anymore because of the the pollution that it was um, uh, causing because uh, they were just burning it they were putting it in their smelters to just try to melt it down. And it was causing all kinds of issues. So a lot of this computer waste is just sitting there accumulating. Yeah, that's an interesting point that you bring up that the last time we saw a a major spike in recycling or or recycled silver would have been much easier to to, um, refine than than the type of recycling that we think about now from computers and cell phones and, and, uh, you know, high tech pieces of equipment like that, right? Yeah. Well, when during during the photographic age, and you know, when when the photography industry was using or consuming twenty five percent of the world's supply of silver, um, that most of that silver was recycled. You know, because when that film got dropped off at the local photography store, the liquids that that uh, were, were used to to you know photo, make those uh, or develop those films was was accumulated and it was picked up by groups that actually took the silver out of this liquid. And it was actually quite a large business, mm-hmm. um, but that business is pretty pretty well gone now. So, Keith, do you think that the current pricing system for the metals is broken? I do, and um, uh, you know, I depend. I suppose depends on what side of the equation you're on. If if you're part of the system, part of the banks, yeah, I think they they love it. Mm-hmm. Um, um, uh, but if you're a miner. Uh, you know, who you who feels that we're not getting fair uh, a dollar for our, our metal that, you know, gives blood, sweat and tears to pull out of the ground and process and get into industry and such a critical strategic metal. I'm referring to silver. Um, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's it's shocking that, you know, what we get paid for uh, such a critical metal. And, uh, you know, I've said a dozen times and then I don't get a lot of traction, unfortunately, because. I'm, I feel somewhat alone often, um, mm-hmm. you know, the miners really need to, you know, get together and, 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 and create a new system. And, uh, you know, why, why does, uh, you know, you know, look at how uranium trades, you know, uh, you know, it's a by contract and then, uh, there's no futures market. Um, uh, so, and, and, uh, you know, oil, you know, I think oil trades more fairly than, um, cause there's so many big players in it. Um, uh, it's, it's more supply demand fundamentally driven, but even it's, it's politically driven to a point, but, um, yeah, I just think we need to get rid of the COMEX. I think the COMEX is really the problem. You know, you can, you know, write a, a, a billion ounces of silver in a single day when the miners are only producing 800 million ounces of silver in a full year, you know, that shows you there's a problem. Mm-hmm. So considering exactly that, Keith, considering the hedging and de-risking mechanism that the futures markets do play, what do you see as a, could you see as a replacement for that system instead? 
Well, I think the Myers just have to break their relationship with the banks, and um, it's hard. It's hard to do. And 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 uh, you know, the, the problem is, you know, a miner produces two types of products. One is a, a, a smelting, or a, like a, a concentrate, mm-hmm. where you know, which is a combination of a variety of different metals and and, and basically just a, a, a pile of black powder, and it's very hard to get rid of. Um, each one of these piles, depending on what mine it comes from, they're all chemically different and, and they all take different processes. And, and the miner has to find a home for this product. And, and, and most of these homes are in China or Korea or, you know, in some cases, Europe or, or potentially Japan. But um, there's very few in North America. There's only a couple. Uh, um, so it's hard to dispose of, of, of this co- concentrate. And there's lots of pollutants in this stuff. You know, it's uh, you're, you're wanting the silver and the gold, of course, or the copper, because that's where the money is. But there's lots of things. There's selenium. There's, you know, all kinds of bad arsenic. There's all kinds of bad stuff in there. Mm-hmm. So anyways, it's very expensive. And um, it, it's it's hard to break the relationship because the the um, you have a financial relationship with the, with the smelter who's got a relationship with the bank. And they already, already have homes for all the metal. Right. So that that creates a very difficult uh, uh, thing to break and then and, and rebuild uh, that system in some other way. You almost have to own the smelter uh, and uh, which a lot of mining companies don't <laughs> don't own their own smelters. Um, dory producers, of which First Majestic is, well, fortunately, all our four mines produce dory bars. And this is a nice, refined product. It's a uh, uh, and, and there's lots of places to send it. You know, like in the United States, there's probably a dozen refineries in the United States and then Canada. So it's easy to get rid of, uh, or pardon me, easy to refine to a triple uh, digit uh, or, you know, triple digit, uh, pardon me, a a, a triple nine uh, pure commercial bar, you know, a thousand ounce, it's very easy to do. And we can warehouse these bars, which we do. You've seen us hold back our sales a number of times. And, And we can do that because we have these physical bars. You know, if we were producing a concentrate, we couldn't do that. So for a company like ourselves, it's easy for us to break that relationship with the bank because we just eliminate them. And we say, and then we go right to Sony or or Apple or whomever and say, yeah, we'll give you our supply. We're not going to fix a price. You know, you're still you're still going to be subject to price price fluctuations, but we'll guarantee that you get X amount of our metal. And then those are the kinds of contracts I think that uh, we should be looking uh, to to achieve. So could you see, you know, a, a possible scenario where there are, let's say, five mining companies in, in one particular area that all go in together to to buy their own smelter to kind of help break that relationship? It's possible. Um, you know, it, it's it's tough permitting a smelter. You know, one of the reasons why there's not that many smelters in North America is because no one wants a smelter in their backyard. You know, that's why most smelters are in China and uh you know, places like that. So, so um, yeah, and they're very expensive. So, you know, to, to build one permit, you're probably talking like a billion dollars and probably 10 years of work. And, uh, you know, it's a big commitment, uh, but it could be of interest. Mm-hmm. And and just for those that, that aren't clear on the, let's say the difference between a, a Dory bar and let's say a thousand ounce Comex bar, what is the, the biggest difference there, Keith? Well, it's, it kind of all comes from the rock. So, so they, you know, it, it usually, you know, a rock is made up of many, many metals. And mm-hmm. it's, you, you've heard the phrase uh, sulfide ores. You know, normally speaking, not all sulfide ores, but normally speaking, sulfides come with all kinds of ugly materials like arsenic, as I mentioned, and lead and zinc and, you know, stuff that you don't want and stuff that doesn't pay. And it actually costs you money. And then the smelters actually penalize you uh, if that rock, you know, contains too much of certain elements. And uh, it can get quite expensive but to get rid of some of this material. Um, you, you're, you're hoping you're going to get paid on the silver and gold or the copper because that's where all the money is. And the penalties that you might be getting are, are, are less than what the value of the good metals are that you want. But it, it's, it's um, you know, it's a, it, it, it is a challenge. And uh, um I'm not sure if I answered your question, but um, what what is the the main difference b- between a Dory bar and a and a thousand ounce Comex bar? Is oh, is the Dory yeah. bar somewhat unrefined compared to the the thousand ounce bar? Right. So uh, sorry about that. Yeah, you, uh, uh, you know a Dory bar, and I just was down at Jerry Canyon, one of our mines in Nevada, and I just uh, 
had some pictures taken with some beautiful gold dory bars and they they weighed like 80 pounds each and uh, i was barely able to pick one up but um <laughs> but but and, and it's, it's solid virtually a solid block of gold it, it's uh, and some silver so it's it's really um you know you're in the mid 90s you know range um um uh, and, and those pollutants are generally just like lead or, or copper, just, you know, miscellaneous kinds of metals that will be in there. Mm-hmm. And then, then you ship it to Johnson Matthew or, you know, Asahi or, you know, a different refinery. They're all over the place. And they just put it through a chemical bath, a chemical process. And then uh, you, through electro winning, uh, they, they pull out all the stuff that they want and, uh, and, they, and they create, you know, commercial bars. And that's what's sold into industry. Perfect. So you you mentioned there, Keith, as well. In in Q three, you decided to withhold a million and a half ounces of silver. So talk to us a bit about what drove that decision, and and how long do you plan to withhold it from the market? Well, we have now liquidated that position. Okay. Um, yeah. So so you know it's it's not our business to you know hold or warehouse metal. You know our 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 shareholders you know, want to see a top line and a bottom line. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was, uh, you know, $35 million worth of silver that didn't hit our revenue line. And, you know, it's, it's you know, the institutions, you know, you know, in my view, they don't particularly like it, right? Because they, 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 they want to see real revenue and real profits. And uh, um, uh, so we do it periodically, but, you know, you, we've had silver go from $18 to $30 in a matter of a, couple of months and then it dropped all the way down to the low 20s and then uh you know i just figured it's this time it, it was just so anomalous to me and and uh, i just thought a bounce was going to occur and and uh you know the old my old trading blood in me because you know that's where i come from you know and uh i just thought it was a good trade and um it turned out yeah we, we made a couple extra dollars on on on, the, on those ounces yeah, and that kind of speaks towards you know being able to invest in in management and and how the company is run versus just always liquidating whatever you have, right? Right, exactly. And uh, you know, it's you know, if you look at go back fifteen years and uh, maybe even longer than that, but uh, and because the number I watch to see if I'm successful or not is are we beating the average COMEX for the quarter? So, and I watch those sales. So our gold and silver sales, I have not, because we report what our, you know, selling price, average selling price for that quarter was. And I always look at the COMEX and I go, hmm, okay, how good was I this quarter? And I usually, I, I, I'm not, I, I think they beat me maybe only a couple of times. <laughs> so, Keith, in your view, has the mining industry really improved fundamentally over the last 20 years? And if so, what do we need for mainstream investors to see the value that these mining companies are producing? Well, what I see, you know, is, is um, you know, in Mexico, you know, we, we've been in Mexico for you know, 19 years now, and uh, we started hiring young, young kids uh, out of university. There's a couple of really good mining universities or engineering universities in, in, in Mexico mm-hmm. that produce a lot of really good talent. And, uh, um, you know, we're hiring entire graduating classes, you know, 20 kids, uh, you know, girls and guys, you know, electrical engineers, chemical engineers, and, you know, they're, you know, tw- mid twenties and, um, you know, they're coming, uh, into first majestic, uh, with iPads and iPhones and, uh, you know, they're walking around and they're going, Hmm, you know, all these old farts, like, what, 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 what are you doing? <laughs> You know, what are you doing it that way for? You know, there's a much better way of doing it. And it's really interesting. And that we, we, this has been going on for well over a decade. And a, and a, and a good handful of those original hires that we hired um, still work for the company today and, and in management positions. And they're in their mid thirties, and uh, um, uh, and they're just they're leaders within our business, and we continually do this because um, you know the mining sector, as I said earlier, is just a slow moving beast. You know, you 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 know you have a lot of you know older people uh, like myself that that have been in this business for a long time, educated in a certain way, and there there's this education gap, particularly in the United States and Canada, where where the kids just didn't want to go learn about engineering or mining. You know, they, they, they want to become lawyers or doctors or, or, or whatever. And um, so this sector has been under, um, uh, you know, educated, you know, for, for quite some time. So it's, it's really Latin America that I noticed that's really kind of filling that gap. Uh, and, and even at Jerry Canyon, you know, we have a number of our, our senior people that were educated in Latin America. 
um, in, in engineering because you know those talent pools just aren't available in uh, United States or Canada. So considering that the, the mining sector has become much more profitable, less debt on balance sheets, you know, characteristics like that, Keith, do you see the mainstream investor recognizing that at some point? You know, I could be hopeful, but, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that investors are so short-sighted, you know, and that they're just all momentum driven. Um, you know, you know, if something's going up, people are going to buy it. Like, you know, gold's been sideways for, you know, good 18 months now. And it's, it's hated because it's not moving. Um, uh, the whole mining sector is, is, is down from its highs. Um, uh, and no one wants to invest in the mining sector. But, but the, the second that changes, then mining's the best sector to be in and gold's the best thing to be buying. Um, and it's all headline driven. It's all momentum driven. Um, I don't think many investors look at fundamentals really to any great degree. I think they're all just wanting to make money. And they, I, I look at what's happening today very similarly to what happened in 2000, you know, when, when you know, we had the uh, NAS, NASDAQ boom, you know, the dot-com boom, you know, uh, Y2K, uh, um, you know, and then NASDAQ peaks out in March of 2000 at 5,000 uh, uh, points. And it, you know, over the next three years, it drops 80%. And then that lit up the resource sector and we ran, went into a 10-year bull market in, in resource stocks. That's kind of what I'm thinking is going to happen. Oh, hopefully I'm right. <laughs> but we'll see. So you've, you've said before that there's enough money for the sector at these metal prices to keep exploring. And that's a major change over the last decade when we saw a major lack of exploration. So in your view, have we seen all of the big silver and gold mines being discovered? And have we hit really peak production for the metals? Well, copper and silver, you know, uh, um, are challenging because I think, you know, whether we've hit, hit peak, I don't know, because, you know, peak to me is, is always price related, mm -hmm. right? Because, because all of a sudden, if I'm, if my theory is correct, that we're going to see triple digit silver, you know, uh, which, you know, um, um, call, you know, you know, uh, call it what you want, you know, 125 bucks or something like that, which I think is a reasonable number. You're going to have a whole bunch more money coming into the silver sector, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, a lot of these low grade mines that we know exist, you know, high up in the Andes, you know, that that are going to cost a billion dollars to to build, but um, uh, they could get built, and 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 if they do get built and permit, well, permitted first, and get built, you're talking probably about ten years to to get them into production. Before, mm -hmm. um, and nevertheless, that would add you know, substantial amount of silver to the market. Mm -hmm. um, at, at, at $25 silver, there's not sufficient investment going on. And, and, and you look what's happening in, in a lot of the silver-centered countries around the world. You know, they're, they're becoming more anti-mining. You know, you look what's going on in Peru and uh, Mexico, uh, you know, with some recent news, unfortunately, out of Mexico, you know, Argentina, uh, Chile, uh, you know, uh, Bolivia, you know, the, these countries are, you know, moving to the left and, and, and moving, you know, very much anti-mining. So, you know, at, at, as, as a world population who wants to go green and, 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 and uh, it's very negative news because, you know, we need this metal to achieve these objectives. And if, if these mines keep coming offline um, the way we see them happening, that's a big problem. And of course, an important point there is, you know, if we do see, like you said, for example, $125 silver, we need a sustainable run of the price being up there before those mines are, are permitted and, and built, right? That's a perfect, uh, 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 you're dead on on that, Tommy. I was just in a meeting last night and we we're talking about M&A uh, in the gold sector. And, um, you know, there's still CEOs in the gold sector using twelve dollars or $1,300 gold mm -hmm. in their analysis of, of takeover targets. And, and, and we haven't seen $1,300 gold for a few years now. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if, if these executives don't believe uh, that $1,800 gold or $2,000 gold is here to stay for a sustainable amount of time, mm -hmm. they're not going to make the investments. And, and that's one of the reasons why you're not seeing a lot of M&A activity. So do you see that as a, as a positive or a negative for the industry, Keith, that, that the, the guys that are closest to the, to the ground aren't, aren't counting in $1,800 gold? You know, I blame it on the financial institutions um, and, and the hedge funds because, um, 
you know, dur during the last big run, you know, when gold went up to 1800 and silver got up to 50, 50 bucks back in 2011, you know, there was a lot of big transactions done. Right? And, and uh, uh, you know, the executive teams of those companies felt they were doing the right thing. Um, uh, they were being pushed by the banks to do it. I remember, you know, being, you know, running CEO for Fish Majestic for so long. I was getting deals shown to me on a, on a weekly basis. Oh, you should look at this. You should look at that. And uh, and all very low grade, you know, high cost, uh, you know, uh, assets, which would take, you know, a sustained long term high metal price to, to, to uh, permit and build and so on and so forth. And I didn't take the jump and, 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 and get, you know, take advantage of any of them but i know a lot of teams did and a lot of mining companies did take on some pretty big assets and then over as the market turned you know over the next five years they were highly criticized you know for for doing what the banks were basically telling them they should do mm -hmm. and and it was the banks and the institutions who actually funded these acquisitions who came out against the executive teams of the mining companies so now we're not back into a relatively high price metals market, you know, maybe not high price, but better prices anyways. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we're not seeing that activity because in my view, these management teams are paranoid about running into the same problem they did before. Mm -hmm. So maybe a, a bit of, you know, conservative estimates is, is actually good for the way that the, the industry is being run, right? I suppose, yeah, you, you probably may not see, you know, some of the uh, big transactions. And, and uh, but look, if if you need to be big to build a billion dollar mine, mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you know, look at Springpole, the uh, mine that uh, the first mining gold owns. I'm the chairman of that company. And, uh, you know, it's going to require seven hundred million dollars to build that. And, mm -hmm. and we're two years into a four year uh, permitting process, um, you know. You know, how's first mining going to raise seven hundred million dollars? You know, they're they're going to need a partner. They're going to need a you know a big partner to come in and and, and assist with that. So, you know, the, the big guys have to play. So they they you know they 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 need to be using you know, if we if we expect to produce more metal, which we have to do to achieve all the things that we want to do as a human race, the mining sector has to be more aggressive. Mm -hmm. Keith, you mentioned first mining gold. And also the the Jarrett Canyon mine, and you've of course been widely known for your focus on silver. So, what makes the move towards gold more appealing to you here? Well, it wasn't a matter of being more appealing. Um, there's a couple of decisions that were made, or a couple of reasons why I made that decision. One was political risk. Um, you know, Mexico is not what it was. You know, 19 years ago when I put together the company. Mm -hmm. um, I felt it was time for us to step out and and, and look for an, uh, other assets. You know, we we've been looking for silver assets, um, uh, you know, for the last couple of years, and they're just extremely difficult to find good silver assets. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, Peru is is a uh, you know a good place to find them, but I don't want to go to Peru, mm -hmm. um, nor nor do I want to produce a bunch of lead and zinc. Um, uh, and a lot of these silver assets, you know, are are, are really only thirty percent silver, and then then the rest is, is zinc and lead. Um, and, and that's not of interest to me. So a lot of assets were eliminated from our, our, our list of the potential targets. Um, this asset was privately owned. Jared Canyon was privately owned. Um, if it was publicly owned, I'm sure it would have probably been, probably had a market cap of a billion dollars, I, I would think, um, or, or somewhere around that number. You know, we picked it up for 470 million and then we feel that it's expandable. So when we look at targets, we would, what, what can we do to improve the asset? You know, it is, can we increase the life of mine? You know, can we reduce costs? Can we increase production? Uh, what are the reasons why it's operating as poorly as it is right now? And identify them, see if our talent can, can make changes uh, to, to improve the asset. And that's what we do. You know, we, we, we're basically turnaround artists. Um, and if you look at all our acquisitions over the last 19 years, you know, we've always bought out of favor assets that were somehow struggling, usually due to lack of capital or lack, lack of talent. Um, and, and we could bring that to the table. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Jared Canyon, we think is a perfect asset for us. Yes, it's 100 percent gold, but it is Dory bars. So that, that's a big deal to have a Dory producer. Um, and and, and it's, the mill has got a 5,000 ton per day throughput and it's operating at half that number. Um, and we think we can get it up to 4,000 tons by the end of 2023. And our targets to hit somewhere close to 200,000 ounces of gold 
in 2024, which is you know basically twice the size that it is today. Mm-hmm. It, it's funny that you mentioned that that phrase of being a uh, turnaround artist or, or turnaround specialist. I spoke with Jeff Clark last week, and he said exactly that about you guys stepping into into Jarrett Canyon. So, how do you go about identifying inefficiencies within projects that you're looking at? Well, it's it's you know, of course, we have a big staff, you know, of people and, and a lot of talent behind me. You know, you know, I'm I'm the spokesperson and the founder, but there's a lot of people behind me that you know are, are there doing a lot of good work. And um, so we we go grassroots, you know, right to site, you know, interview management, look at processes, you know. Um, you know, metallurgy is a big deal for us. We, we're very good metallurgists. We have a very strong metallurgical team. Um, you know, when we bought um, uh, Santa Elena back in 2015, for example, um, the recoveries there were 65%, and today is 96% in you know, a matter of a couple of years. And that's just our knowledge and our work. And then when we're, you know, we achieve those types of things, you know, uh, all the time. And um, uh, so metallurgy, then geology, of course, is critical. You know, like, you know, is this resource expandable? Is the life of mine expandable? You know, if if, if there's a million ounces of gold there with, with no expandability, it's going to be a, of a lot less interest to us than, than if it's a million ounces of gold and our geos are excited about it and they think, you know, there could be five million, you know, uh, uh, but it's going to take time and money to get there. Mm-hmm. So we need to have a geological view as well. You said earlier that you didn't want to go to Chile and, you know, looking at the recent projects that you've been involved with, let's say Jarrett Canyon in Nevada or um, first mining gold in Northern Ontario, are you sticking to these jurisdictions just because they are so much safer to be able to operate in and and more predictable, let's say? Uh, Yes, absolutely. Um, um, We're, I'm not saying there's not going to be another M&A transaction in Mexico. It, they're, they're, you know, we have our eyes on a couple of interesting assets in Mexico. Um, it takes two to tango. If, if uh, one happens to come our way, we might decide to pull the trigger and, 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 and buy one. But um, uh, the focus right now is really United States and Canada. Uh, and uh, we are, we've got a couple of balls up in the air there. And again, I don't know if things are going to happen because... Is, you, know, you just never know, but um, you know, we're always looking around for good assets, but hopefully the next one will be much more silver centric. Mm-hmm. So of course, the, the last time you and I spoke, you had just acquired Jarrett Canyon. So can you give us an update on, on what has happened since you acquired it and the, the path forward for it? Yeah, well, the first thing we did was um, uh, eliminate, uh, well, let go, I guess is the better word, um, the top uh, management team. There was 18 individuals that we um, eliminated virtually on day one, uh, and uh, and put our own people in place. Uh, uh, so that whole management team is now brand new. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, you know, our COO uh, says that you know, of all our minds, it's the it's the best management team we have in place in the entire company. So you know, the site's done a really good job. HR's done a really good job. Uh, um, Steve and uh, um, Michael, the, the uh, GM there, has done an ex- excellent job uh, putting the talent pool together. Mm-hmm. And then once once you accomplish that, then you start have to making investments in, in, in inefficiencies. So you know, um, uh, and so mill improvements. We one of the interesting things that we did early on was we we tried to break the mill. You know, to to you know see how, how you know where where's the weaknesses. So what its capacity is. Yeah, so we ramped this thing up, you know, to over four thousand tons a day to see what breaks, and uh, you know, of course, a few things broke. So, so that you know, that gives us an idea because you know, because by by the end of twenty twenty three, our goal is to have this thing running at four thousand tons a day, twenty you know, three hundred sixty five days a year. So you have to capex around that, and you have to know what to do. So, so that's one of the early things we've done, and now we're making those investments. So, um, you know, there's about a fifteen million dollar investment going into the mill in twenty twenty two. And then expiration, it's just, you know, we've got seven rigs going there. They haven't drilled a hole, an ex- a true expiration hole on this property for 15 years. And, wow. uh, yeah, it's it's all the drilling that they've done is just for mining, underground mining, just following the structures and because and, they didn't want to spend any extra capital because it's always been cash starved. So um, so we're, we're uh, drilling uh, in 2022. I think we're doing 100,000 meters of drilling Um uh, on at Jerry Canyon and uh, testing all kinds of targets that uh, we, we identified. Well, not just us, but prior management teams have identified. And 
we're getting some pretty interesting results um, uh, already early on. And uh, you know, we think the life of mine is going to be, we're going to put out a new 43101, we hope by the end of uh, 2022. And we expect to see, you know, pretty substantial increase in life of mine. So considering that it's in Nevada, are there any other plays in, in and around that area that interest you as an investor, Keith? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, well, you know what? Two, two, two things. Um, you know, from First Majestic's perspective, you know, uh, uh, you know, we we are you know looking around. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're we're focusing on silver assets um, uh, uh, more than gold, but also we're also looking for feed. You know, because uh, uh, that mill, uh, it's going to take us a good year to eighteen months to really develop enough ore ourselves to fill that mill. So there are juniors in the area that uh, have approached us and uh, there is the potential that we could be buying some ore from, from neighbors uh, you know, just to fill the mill in the interim. Um, but from a personal perspective, um, you know, I, I, my first investment in Nevada was really at Silver One. And, uh, to, you know, we still have our eye on that company and, uh, you know, it's still early stage there. They, they, um, um, they've had interest in drill program. Um, but um, I guess my probably my largest personal investment in, in, in the state of Nevada is Nevada King, um, run by a mutual friend of ours, uh, 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 Colin uh, Cattell. And uh, uh, you know, he's from uh, Newfound Gold, um, was one of the founders of that company. Was Everyone knows it's done an impressive, you know, very impressive uh, or very well, I should say. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he's, he, you know, we're hoping for some similar successes that uh, – Nevada King and um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, we first Majestic actually made a equity investment in a company called BlackRock Silver, which is you know getting some pretty interesting uh, uh, drill results as well. So we're we're kind of spreading our thing uh, you know from a personal perspective and a corporate perspective. You know, we're kind of spreading our our fingers around Nevada. It's interesting to talk to you about what you think about as a as a CEO that that is in the industry. What you think about when you think about investing in the sector itself. So Keith, are, are you looking for the, the people to be able to run the proper projects? Are you looking for jurisdictional risk? What do you think about or what do you look at that's that's top of your list when you're thinking about investing in a company? Yeah, it's always people first. Um, uh, you know, jurisdiction and price and stock, stock structure and the asset all comes into the equation, but I, I don't even get to those those questions until I pass the test or the management team passes my my first test, and that's mm-hmm. you know what have they done historically? You know what you know um, have they created wealth before? You know what um, you know who do they have around them? You know what what uh, what's the skill set of people? And uh, you know are they serious players? You know, are they actually really trying to build a business, or, or are they just trying to you know? Uh, you know, pump a stock. You know, um, you know, what, you know, what's what's the business plan? You know, what's behind this? And uh, when it comes down to trust, a lot of cases. So you, you, you know, I, I I like to reinvest in management teams over over time, and then I've uh, done that over over twenty you know thirty years, and and uh, you know, management teams come to me and and uh, you know are trying to put together a new company, and and uh, you know, I'll say yes right away just because I know them, and you know. <laughs> The, the amount of my investment will depend on things like jurisdiction, you know, the asset mm-hmm. itself, you know, it's uh, like, I, I, I don't, I don't like lithium. Uh, um, but, but if, um, if the right management team came to me and said, Hey, I'm putting a lithium company together, I would probably give them some company the money, despite the fact I don't like lithium. Mm-hmm. Um, right. But, but if, if that same management team came to me with a silver project or a, a you know, a nickel or a copper project, yeah, you know, my my interest level and my investment would be much larger. Mm. So, when you think about the end game, Keith, are there any any you know thoughts you have or that you'd like to share with us around when when it's time to actually start getting out of a position, or is that you know more cycle dependent? No, I, I'm I'm pretty strict on that, and uh, you know I don't get the tops. Um, you know, I rare. Well, I have got tops before. Um, um, I got. Top in uh, a company I just uh, been liquidating just um, about six months ago, which is kind of nice. But um, um, so I, you know, the when I buy a stock, you know, I'm I'm ex- I, I figure out when I write my check what my expectations are for that stock. Mm-hmm. You know, I say, hey, you know, is this is this a, a, a trade that I'm only that that I'm going to be out within a year? 
<laughs> and and my expectations is is a hundred percent gain or two hundred percent gain or or thereabouts, maybe three hundred percent gain. And I'll figure I'll just kind of formulate that in my mind. Or is this going to be a five year investment where where this is my first toes in the water on this company and I'm going to accumulate a much larger position over time. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking I'm looking for a five to ten bagger, you know, over over you know a three to five year period. Mm-hmm. So um so once I decide on what type of investment it is, when that stock hits those levels, I'm a seller, mm-hmm. right? Right away. And I, I, I'm depending on the fundamentals, I might sell less. You know, if some if if three hundred percent is kind of when I start really looking at something, and I'll likely sell twenty five percent of my position at three hundred percent gain, mm-hmm. um, and usually at a, you know four to five hundred percent gain, I'll probably be out of half my position. Um, or, or I could be out of all of it. It just depends on, you know, I'll start looking at fundamentals at that point. What's driving the stock? You know, is it drill results? Is it, you know, going into production, you know, financials uh, or, or, you know, what, what's driving it? So uh, I'll make a call whether I should be at 100% or whether I should hold on, maybe, maybe keep 25% of my position for, you know, that 10 bagger. Um, but I don't hold on to my entire position looking for a 10 bagger. I think, you know, cause they don't come very often mm-hmm. and, you know, you, you know, even a five bagger, you know, are pretty rare, but, um, uh, I'm not sure if that helps, but <laughs> I, I, I'm just very disciplined. I just, uh, and I always, always like that. As you're, you know, going through your answer there, I was going to say discipline seems to be very important on, on being able to get out of a position and, and having that number in mind before you even write the check. Yeah. No, I look at that stock uh, just last year and I, I came into it in the dollar fifty range and uh, I wasn't um, introduced to it during the seed range and for seed capital raising range, but uh, I liked it when it went public and I, so I came in with a relatively significant position and, uh, and the stock was at four bucks within like literally uh, two months. And I start liquidating my my position. I was out of it by five dollars, and um, um, and I was quite happy. You know, three hundred percent gain. You know, in a matter of you know three months, um, um, much more than I expected in such a short period of time. Well, the stock's now twelve bucks, mm-hmm. um, but I don't care. Like, you know, I did well. And, and, and you know, the nicest thing about it is that every every person that bought my stock made money. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, and, so it's a, <laughs> that's a good thing. Absolutely. And as you were mentioning, you know, layering into a position, do you have to see the company just hitting the milestones that they've laid out for themselves for you to keep layering into that position? Yeah, I stay in contact with all the companies, you know, uh, that I'm active in. Uh, if it's a small investment, where it's just a $25,000 punch or something just because a friend of mine suggested I buy it or something, mm-hmm. you know, I'll, that's a different story. But if it's a, you know, a substantial investment where I'm accumulating a position over time, and, and a lot of these stocks are highly illiquid. You know, they, they, you know I'm, I'm accumulating a couple of stocks right now, <clears throat> and I'm having a hard time. If, if I buy 5,000 shares in a day, that's a big trade. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, it takes a good year you know, to, to accumulate a reasonable position. Right. And in a, a situation like that, I'll be talking to management at least once a month and uh, just getting an update on what's going on. And then I'll walk, walk, I'll read the financials when they come out. I'll read any filings that, that they're putting out. I'll look at the circular when, when it gets mailed out. And uh, so I, I'm pretty um, active. Excellent. Keith, is there, uh, is there anything else you'd like to touch on before we wrap up here? Uh, no, no, it's, it's, um, you know, people, I took a company uh, public recently called a company called Snowline Gold uh, in the Yukon. People should have a look at that. Jeff Clark, you were mentioning, you interviewed, he, he's uh, um, uh, talking about Snowline a lot these days, which is kind of nice. It um, uh, looks like a whole gold cap that's being developed. And, uh, you know, and uh, of course, Nevada King, you know, people should really have a good look at that one. It's, it's super cheap right now. It's, it's down substantially from where it was uh, you know, a few months ago when it first came out. So, um there was some a stock distribution that was done <clears throat> from um, one of the major holders. And I think that's created a little bit of pressure on the stock. So it's been, a, in my view, anyways, um, do your own due diligence. But um, I, I'm a buyer. So uh, if people want to look at that company, I think they should probably go have a look. Excellent, Keith. And of course, um, you know, you're, you have a very interesting Twitter feed. You put out a lot of good articles and, and videos at Keith underscore Newmeyer, and you can check out, you know, First Majestic, firstmajestic.com and all of the other companies mentioned. 
on their websites. Keith, thanks yep. so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's good chatting again, Tom, and I uh, look forward to do it, do it again sometime. Absolutely. Happy to have you back anytime, Keith. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.